Welcome to part two. Yeah, welcome And to it's Jack the Ripper. No, yeah. sorry, it's John Hume. I'm talking about <laughs> Right. Keep your phones on silent. We'll have a good one. Right. We're going to race through this one. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm going to make this a bit quicker. So, yeah, you'll all be pleased and relieved to hear, I'm sure, that it's nowhere near as long as that one. Um, okay, but it's, a, it's quite an interesting little tale. I'm sure you'll be intrigued with it. Um, I hope you're all still awake. I know that was a really long session and uh, of necessity, but um, this, as I say, is much, much shorter. So, and I'll try and condense it as much as I can without leaving out any of the salient points. Okay, so I think we all know what the Jack the Ripper murders were, in as much as the, it was a series of murders committed in 1888 in the east end of London, um, during which five young women who were prostitutes, <coughs> except one. Yeah, that's one, wasn't it? No, fourth one wasn't. Um, yeah, there were prostitutes apart from one. And, um, but the mystery has dragged on for well over a century now as to who actually was the killer. And the reason that the killer was never found will become apparent as I go through this. Um, it's an intriguing tale, as I say, and I'm sure you'll all be more than a little gobsmacked by it. Right, so if we're all ready. Um, first of all, there were five murder victims. Okay. Uh, the first one was a lady by the name of Mary Ann Nichols, and then there was a lady called Annie Chapman. The third one was Elizabeth Stride, and then Catherine Eddowes, and finally Mary Kelly, who um, was the fifth and final victim. And all these murders took place within a, it was a four month period during the latter stages of 1888 in Victorian London. Okay. Now, story in a nutshell because I'm it's far far more to it than I'm going to tell you tonight but again the full story is in here just a little plug from the books there for anybody who's not already got it um, so as I say it began in 1888 and it all centers around and this is the royal connection here the guy who was the heir, <coughs> the heir to the throne uh, it was the eldest son of King Edward the seventh to be but as I said Queen Victoria was still on the throne King Edward VII was her eldest son, and this guy that I'm talking about now was King Edward VII's eldest son, although at that time it was only Prince Edward, of course. Now, this gentleman went by the name of Prince Albert Victor, and he was the Duke of Clarence, mm -hmm. and he was otherwise known as Prince Eddie. And as I say, it, would, it was going to be the heir to the throne after Victoria had died and his father became king. So he was the eldest son of an eldest son, in fact. Now, interestingly enough, poor old Eddie, he was below average intelligence and partially deaf, uh, suspected to be due to inbreeding, which is obviously a common place thing in, in the royal families. Um, and as a result of this, he was, he was shunned by his family because we know how cold hearted they are, you know, the, the previous session has told us that. Uh, but also, he was a little bit wild, and he was a little bit off the rails. And when he was a teenager, he was a frequent visitor to a homosexual paedophile brothel in the east end of London. And um, there he was, in, he was uh, writing love letters to young lads there who were, you know, obviously from the poor working classes and just trying to earn a little bit of money by doing those horrible things that they do. Um, so, the royal family at this point in time decided to try and take his mind off all this stuff. So, they, uh, they, they tried to get him interested in art. So, they employed a famous artist of the day, it was a guy named Walter Sickert. And Walter Sickert um, was meant to be his tutor, and they were trying to sort of wean him off all these nefarious practices he was getting up to. Um, so, Walter became his tutor. But, I mean, Walter was no angel either. He was up to all sorts of kind of chicanery as well. And um, Walter introduced him to, but to a, a, a young lady by the name of Annie Crook. Now, Annie Crook was a Catholic girl. She worked as a part-time prostitute, and she also worked in a tobacconist shop on Tottenham, Tottenham Court Road. 
and but he fell in love with her. Eddie fell in love with this commoner, and not only was she a commoner, but she was also a Catholic, which is totally taboo for the royal family. I'm not sure whether it's still the case or not, but I know for certain in those days the royal family were not allowed to marry Catholics. Um, maybe somebody can tell me whether that's still the case or not. I believe it to be, but I'm not absolutely, uh, absolutely certain. And horror upon horrors, he actually makes this young girl pregnant. Uh, which was an absolute no-no, of course. And uh, even worse, he actually married her in secret. So you can imagine the, the furore and the consternation that it was caused in the uh, in royal circles. And so they actually uh, they put Eddie under house arrest. They forbid him from seeing her. Um, and uh, Annie was terrified by this time because she was under threat. So she actually gave the baby to Walter Sickert, the art tutor of Eddie, who ran away to France to protect the baby because he was frightened of the consequences of what they would do if they ever got hold of the baby. Um, so he fled to France and they actually, the Queen's surgeon, who was a guy by the name of Sir William Gull, actually had Annie sectioned. Um, although she wasn't mad by any stretch of the imagination, but she, they put her in a, a mental hospital, a lunatic asylum as they were called in those days. And he actually removed part of her brain to make her docile and unresponsive. Aren't <coughs> <coughs> they wonderful, these people, honestly? It just, it just boggles my mind, the stuff that you find out when you research this stuff. So, yeah. So, anyway. Uh, so the royals were hoping to keep all this a secret. Now, Annie Crook had some uh, <coughs> friends, or had a friend, by the name of Mary Kelly. And Mary Kelly had another group of friends, not particularly related to Annie. But Mary, being a, a bit of a madam that she was, decided that she thought it might be a good idea to make some money by blackmailing um, uh, Walter Sickert about it. Now, Walter immediately informed the royal family that he was being blackmailed to <coughs> give all this information out. So, the royals, being as they are, uh, decided to teach these girls a lesson. So what did they do? They put a cover-up operation in place, first of all, of course, as they do. As I said, they can find Eddie, Eddie to house arrest. And a lot of people don't know this, but there is a, a, a Freemasonic Lodge that's connected to um, uh, Kensington Palace, which is exclusively for the royals and all their hangers-on. And this is called the Royal Alpha Lodge. Right? Now, members of the Royal Alpha Lodge, which included some royals and people like, um, ooh, let me see, who were they? Just let me check my notes. Um, there was a guy called William Gull, who was a, who was a Queen's physician, he was, he was a member of it. Uh, a gentleman by the name of J.K. Stephen, who had been Eddie's tutor at Cambridge. A gentleman by the name of Sir Charles Warren, who was the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Lord Randolph Spencer Churchill, mm -hmm. who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time. And these were all members of the Royal Alpha Lodge, and they decided that to teach these girls a lesson, they would perform a ritualistic hunt and kill Masonic ritual. Right? So, they set about hunting these girls down and murdering them one by one. So, one by one, as the girls are found, they're rich, as I said, they're ritualistically murdered in the coach belonging to William Gull, who was the Queen's physician. This is why no blood was ever found. And this is, this is always one of the things about the Jack the Ripper stories. Why was there no blood? Because these girls were absolutely mutilated horrifically. Okay, so there was no blood, blood found because they were actually murdered in the coach uh, on a tarpaulin or whatever, and then the bodies were, when the blood had been drained from them, they were just dumped in the street. Okay, so, now we know that it was Masonic, um, definitely, because all the bodies were deliberately arranged when they were killed in accordance with Masonic ritual, as in the Masonic legend of the murder of Hiram Abiff in, the, in Solomon's Temple. 
which is what the basis of all Freemasonic knowledge is. Now, most of the uh, senior police, as they still are today, of course, were Masons, so they just they must have known about this. But of course, they were covering it all up. So, one by one, these girls were ritualistically murdered. Um, and Catherine Eddowes, who was the fourth victim, she was actually killed in error. She wasn't a prostitute. She wasn't even friends of these girls. But she was mistaken for Mary Kelly, who was the fifth victim, due to the fact that she lived with a guy called John Kelly and used his surname. So they got the wrong information, killed the girl, and she was actually brutally murdered in a place called Mitre Square. Mm. Right? Because they thought they'd got the final girl, and the, the last one was meant to be the end of the ritual. So she was actually dumped in Mitre Square, which has obviously got Freemasonic connotations. In fact, there's a huge Freemasonic <coughs> one to where she was killed. And the murderers scrawled, I say murderers, because it wasn't one murderer, it was a group, it was that group of people I've just mentioned, scrolled on the walls <coughs> a legend that said, the Jews are, uh, how, how did it go? Um, yeah, the Jews, that's the one, the Jews, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the Jews are the ones that will not be blamed for, for nothing. That was it, it was, it was a nonsensical phrase. Uh, but by the Jews, they didn't mean the J-E-W-S, they meant the J-U-W-E-S which it refers to, again, back to the Masonic legend of Hiram Abyss. And uh, the Jews were Jubala, Jubalo and Jubalum, the three murderers in Masonic legend of Hiram Abyss. Now, um, Sir Charles Warren, who was the, uh, one of the perpetrators of the crime, he appeared on the scene immediately and ordered that that legend be washed off the wall, um, which was uh, the guy who was in charge of the, uh, the investigation, um, uh, was absolutely horrified by it, and you know because it's destroying evidence, isn't it, in a murder? Um, so, as I said, for a short time they believed that they that they'd completed the task, and hence that final Masonic message. But then they realised somehow that they killed the wrong person. They still had to find Mary Kelly. So all those all those four have been killed in the coach, but they now panicked because they had to find this. Mary Kelly. Uh, it took them a few weeks to find her, but when they found her, they hurriedly killed her in her own lodgings. Okay, and there is a famous photograph of her lying on a bed. I mean, it's a very indistinct photograph because I forget this is 1888, but it does look horrific. I mean, a body is just totally mutilated, and all the organs were arranged in a Masonic fashion around the the body. Um, and the and the, the murders were committed by. Again, Masonic ritual, that is drawing a knife across the throat from left to right and slitting the body and throwing the entrails over the left shoulder. This is how they did it. And this is absolutely Masonic ritual. Okay, Masons are told this, so this is what will happen to them if they disclose it. any secrets. Okay, so the Frederick Abilene, the guy who was in charge and who was horrified by the, the, the Sir Charles Warren interfering and... Uh, scrubbing that legend off the wall, he, he, he resigned in, in disgust and uh, because the, uh, the Ripper case was actually declared closed at this point. So there was no further investigations, so basically they, they got away with it. Uh, by this time, Prince Eddie is now severely mentally ill himself because he underwent a complete mental breakdown when he found out what happened to uh, Annie and the baby. Um, so they decided to get rid of Eddie. Okay? So he was sent, into, sent up to Scotland into the care of the Earl of Strathmore, um, who lived in Glam's Castle, which is not that far from Balmoral apparently. So they took him to Balmoral originally. Uh, I don't know why that should be, but that's what they did. They took him to Balmoral uh, prior to him being taken to Glam's Castle to be given into the care of the Earl of Strathmore. So they decided to uh, get rid of him for good, okay? Because uh, it, it basically was an embarrassment to the royal family. So, uh, Randolph Churchill, who was Winston Churchill's father, as many of you know, and a coach driver by the name of John Netley, 
took him to the edge of a cliff, apparently Balm Balm Balmoral, getting my teeth in, is surrounded by cliffs, so they took him to the edge of this cliff and they pushed him off. But somehow, incredibly, he managed to survive <laughs> and cling on to life. <laughs> and, and three days later, he crawled all the way back <laughs> to Balmoral, and so they decided that that must be fate. So they decided to revert to Plan A, which was incarceration at Glam's in the care of the Earl of Strathmore. Now in 1892, the royal family announced Eddie's death to the world uh, from tuberculosis. But he actually lived until 1933, but of course it won't tell you that in the history books. I mean, what do, what do history books tell us? But interestingly, as part of the deal for looking after Eddie for the rest of his life, the royals agreed with Strathmore that one of his daughters would eventually be allowed to marry a heir to the throne. And that was part of the deal. Okay. And this promise was actually fulfilled 30 years later when Lady Elizabeth Bow Lyon, the, the daughter, the eldest daughter of the Earl of Strathmore, daughters, was allowed to marry uh, and married the future King George VI. Now, in 1973, the BBC produced a bizarre docu-drama series, which if some of you are old enough to have watched that, I remember watching it. Um, it was absolute bollocks, basically, from start to finish. But, um, and, and what it was, what it consisted of, was it was tasking fictional TV detectives um, to solve the Ripper mystery. Okay, Now, as part of that, they, the BBC research team actually tracked down a retired Scotland Yard, a long retired Scotland Yard de detective who put them in touch with a, a man called Joseph Sickert, who was Walter Sickert's son. And he was very elderly by this time. And the final programme featured Joseph Sickert, and he told all the above story that I've just told you, which in, is, a, is very sparse, by the way, there's a lot, lot more to it, but because of time constraints, I don't want to go into all the full details, so I'm trying to condense it. So, the final programme featured Joseph Sickert, and he told this story to the BBC audience in all its gory detail, and this was actually voted on at the end of the series by the viewers, and they all agreed that that was the most likely story out of all of them. Okay, and so there was a guy by the name of Stephen Knight, who wrote a book called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. And he contacted Joseph after this BBC program, and his book was a result of their meeting. But strangely enough, for some reason, Knight actually impl implicated Walter Sickert in the plot. And as a result of this, Joseph then decided to come out and deny the whole thing and say that he made it up. Not just his father's part in it, but the entire story. And said he made it up for publicity, which of course is absolute nonsense. Um, you know, why would he get involved in the first place? It's just crazy. So, in another twist, in the final interview of the Duke of Windsor, who was the former King Edward VIII who abdicated before his death in the 1970s, he confessed that the Queen Mother had always been in love with him. Because don't forget, he was the eldest son, so <coughs> he was the heir to the throne. So the Queen Mother had always been in love with him, and not George, the Queen's father. And this was verbally backed up by the Duchess of uh, Kent, who was Wallace Simpson. And I've got the transcript for that, that interview, which is very interesting. It's in the book. And um, so it was intended that they should have been, in, that they were going to be introduced with a specific aim of arranging a royal marriage between the future King Edward VIII and the eldest daughter of the Earl of Strathmore. But he was, to he, to he was a playboy, this guy, as we know, and he totally rejected her. So this, I believe, is the reason why he was forced off the throne. Nothing to do with marrying Mrs. Simpson. If they wanted him to continue as king, he would have been allowed to marry Mrs. Simpson. There's absolutely no question about it, in my mind anyway. So I believe this is why he was forced to abdicate, because he didn't marry the Earl of Strathmore's daughter. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so she decided, they decided she would have to settle for second best in his younger brother. 
And it was her, the Queen Mother, who absolutely fought tooth and nail to have them disinherited by the royals and banished to France. And it, is it then also possibly, possible, and perhaps most int intriguing of all, as I say, that <coughs> Edward VIII was forced into abdication deliberately um, whilst he was still king in order that that decades old promise would come to fruition and that Elizabeth Boleyn, the daughter of the Earl of Strathmore, could become queen as promised several years earlier, decades earlier. That's it in a very small nutshell. It's far more complex than that. But as I say, I've cut it down because of time constraints. I didn't want it to go beyond 10 o'clock. And if anybody's got any questions, please. Yeah, what through. happened to this child? Yes, The young girl was brought up by Walter Sickert in France and she actually married Sickert's real son, Joseph. Joseph was her husband. Um, she would be She was a there. lot younger than him. He, he was about 30 years older than him. Wow. Mm. So when did she die? She... Uh, we, nobody knows. But recently. Oh God, well no, she was born in. 1880 yeah, yeah. something. She had a, she had a royal, uh, you know, the lane went back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Edward was the child of Princess May of Tech. And Princess May of Tech. Oh yes, of course. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. He was born six months after the marriage right. because Princess May of Tech had been engaged to his brother and his brother died mysteriously. Alright, just now that I'm thinking. So who do you think, whose hand was on the knife that was actually committing the... Sir William Gold, the Queen's physician. Right. He, because it, it, all the reports that came out said this was a guy who understood anatomy who'd done this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Sir William Gold, Lord Randolph Churchill, J.K. Mm -hmm. Stephen, and... I've forgotten. <laughs> Somebody. Uh, Sir Charles Warren from the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, they were all involved in it. Now, there have been many, many, many books written on the whole rip up story. Oh, yeah. yeah. Probably been more written most, on most of it is anything. garbage, of course. Yeah. yeah. The, the, one of the, the latest thing I watched about this guy who was put in the frame, I think it's called Tomalty, he was supposed to be some. Oh, uh, Francis Tomalty, yeah. Uh, Canadian or something. Yeah. Like, and they said he was. They reckon he was a serial killer and he, and he was travelling around the world. And Very possible. Holmes was yeah. a serial killer. Yeah. So it the was seemed to be a likely suspect. So mm. a There's a lot of likely suspects. I mean, you know, but this story fits. And, and all the BBC, yeah. not, that, not that we're in favour of the BBC, but I mean, all the BBC viewers voted this as being the most likely solution. Because all, all the different episodes in that series focused on different murderers like Francis Tomalty, there was a, another guy as well. Yeah, that girl at the back there, yes? Uh, what about the Yorkshire Do you think there was similarities between... It's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I've not investigated was, that. It's interesting. I'm thinking the way he mutilated them, was that satanic? Was that I've never actually investigated the Ripper murders, the Yorkshire yeah, murders. Yeah, yeah. 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 that, was, that was the guy that cast as Wearside Jack. <coughs> that was the person that called Wearside Jack because they thought he had a Sunderland accent. No, 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 no. I got an interview with that, the police came to our house. Because I, I worked in the Midlands. You know, it was a similar sort of thing, like uh, the Ripper murders. Well, they did have a Sunderland accent, they were also from Sunderland, wasn't they? But he, he was. Ex um, he was and then to get arrested a few years ago yeah. when they found yeah. out who he actually was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It could have been. Yeah, I know there's all sorts of speculation about Savile and yeah. his relationship with Sutcliffe and all the rest of it. John, you've had a. You've been in touch with the Sheep Farm Studio people. They did a clip um, of um, Jimmy Savile on Juno Fix It getting um, a, a request from Frank Bruno to meet the Yorkshire Ripper, and it was on like Chelsea's TV. Frank Bruno meets right. Jack Ripper, arranged by Savile. Yeah, well, Frank well, Bruno is a bit of a weirdo. What was the program called, Jim? Fucks it for you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you the Daily Mirror. Couldn't get one on the Yorkshire Ripper, sorry. Brilliant, thank you. Did you enjoy that? And uh, 